Good evening. My name is Christine Chopra and on behalf of the Wheeler Centre and Free Palestine Melbourne, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that tonight's conversation is taking place on unceded sovereign land. I am joining you from the land of the Kula Nation of the Wurundjeri people and we pay respect to their elders past and present and to the elders of all communities that this conversation is reaching out to this evening. I welcome you to this event, Pursuing Justice, Human Rights in an Age of Crisis, which is presented in partnership with both the Wheeler Centre and Free Palestine Melbourne. And it is a topic dear to many of our hearts, exploring how in the midst of intersectional global crises, how do we address the escalating humanitarian and environmental challenges in the 21st century, many of which have been amplified by COVID. I'm delighted to introduce the speakers in today's conversation. Um, the leading, leading the conversation, we have two prominent Australians, the first of which is Julian Burnside QC. Julian is a Melbourne barrister. He joined the bar in 1976 and took silk in 1989. He specialises in commercial litigation and has acted in many very contentious cases, including the MUA waterfront dispute, the cash for comment inquiry cases, cases for Alan Bond and Rose Porteous, but has become known for his human rights work and acted pro bono in many high profile refugee cases. He's an outspoken opponent of the mistreatment of people who come to Australia seeking protection from persecution. And his latest book is Watching Out, Reflections on Justice and Injustice. Joining, we have Stuart Rees AM. Stuart is a professor emeritus at the University of Sydney. He's a former professor of social work and social policy, co-founder of Sydney University's Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies, and inaugural director of the Sydney Peace Foundation. He's the author of poetry anthologies and books on social justice, including his recent creation, Cruelty or Humanity, here it is, which was nominated for the 2021 British Academy Book Prize, and he was awarded an Order of Australia for Services to International Relations and the Jerusalem of Quds Peace Prize uh, as recent as 2018. So welcome both of you to this online conversation in lockdown, but uh, the issues are pertinent as ever, no matter where we are. Glad to have you both here. COVID-19 has thrown the world's greatest human rights challenges into sharp relief, from the political crisis in Myanmar, crises in Yemen, in the Middle East, in Africa, to surveillance and censorship in China, to the oppression of Palestinians, to global warming, disarmament, restrictions on migration and border control here in Australia and abroad. In many cases, the changes brought about by the pan pandemic have only amplified existing pressures, reigniting long-standing human rights debates, and they've manifested in expressions here in Australia from diaspora communities and supporters as well as detractors amongst the general population. So there's been a lot of mixed feelings about these issues and events, but strong feelings nonetheless. As a starter, though, for this particular conversation, I wanted to ask both you, Julian, and then, and then Stuart, could you outline in your own words what you deem to be the prevailing human rights issues in our world today, um, given what you think they are now compared to what they were, say, 20 years ago, if indeed you think the parameters that cause these injustices have changed? So I'll ask you first, Julian. Um, can I start by saying I think the book is a wonderful addition to the literature on this subject. Um, it, it's really terrific, especially because what it does is to weave into the narrative about human rights. It, it weaves poetry and, in my opinion, the arts really offer us one of the great insights into the way human beings can be. Um, so it's very important. In fact, I, I have to say I couldn't help but think as I read the book I couldn't help but think of one of my favourite very short poems by Robert Frost called Fire and Ice. And it goes, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favour fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. And that seems to me to capture perfectly the world we live in today. Um, the fact is that human rights are very important because we are all human beings. 
Now, if you look at what is going on in Yemen and in Myanmar recently, uh, what's going on with the Hazaras at the um, bidding of the Taliban in Afghanistan at the moment? You would really have trouble believing that they understand that the people they're attacking are also human beings. I think the key to this book is to appreciate that we need to understand that all of us are human beings and to be able to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who are under attack. Uh, it's amazing to think that the Hazaras are being attacked the way they are in Afghanistan now, 20 years after 9-11. And, and of course, they're coming to the fore as the Americans and the Australians and other forces quit the country. Um, what was done in Myanmar by the Buddhists to the Rohingya people is almost beyond belief. Uh, we need to understand these things. These are immense challenges as the world peeps at its own end because of climate change and COVID. Hmm. A lot of conflating issues. Thank you, Julian. Stuart, what about you? What do you perceive right now yeah. to be the greatest human rights issues and challenges? Well, let me first of all thank Julian for his uh, for that oversight of a whole range of issues, which you, Tasneem, also covered very effectively in in your introduction. I mean, we there's this major issue, which is about the abusive use of power, the rise of of authoritarianism. The, the the rise of um, fake news as though nobody could, nobody should tell the truth the the rise of um, uh, the erosion of civil liberties through the multiplication of anti-terrorist laws in a country like Australia so that rise of authoritarianism and the stifling of of news even if you like the efforts to to try to stop this discussion occurring uh, this week would be uh, one, you might say, small example. So that's that's one issue, this massive abuse of power, and you can see it also in the pandemic of domestic violence across just about every every country. Um, the, the the second issue is obviously the the, the problem of um, global warming and the the destruction of a planet which which um, uh, may may be in jeopardy right at this moment. If you saw John Kerry's appeal last night, you, could, you, you have a sense of, um, of urgency. And then there's the, the, the problem of um, living with a, a pandemic that looks as a, a, a virus, but looks as though in various forms it may be permanent. So there's a whole, and, and under the cover of that, um, that virus, there's, there's evidence from all over the world. I was recently in the Philippines, uh, to show that under the shadow of COVID, uh, human rights abuse increase uh, astronomically. So those are issues which we didn't have even 10 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. That is a great overview, and I think there's, um, there's a lot to get through in the, next, in the next 45 minutes or so. And I will be asking you a series of questions about these issues, as well as many questions that we've gratefully received from the Wheeler Centre from from viewers and supporters who uh, were kind enough to send those questions in. So I'll, I've interspersed, you know, hopefully everyone will be represented in, in their opinions in this conversation. Um, Julian, I want to start with you. I mean, I, I we'll start from the start. If you can just give me an oversight, an overview rather, of what human rights are and how are they, how are they regarded in your opinion in Australia? Um, human rights involve those rights and interests that each of us has as a human being. The primary human right is the right to life, um, the right to a free existence subject to the law, um, and you know, things of that sort. It's, it's a pretty broad area. Uh, I think the difficulty is that human rights tend to be a nuisance uh, to people in power because they get in the way of what they can do. Um, in Australia, human rights are simply not adequately recognised at all because most law that affects most people is made by the federal parliament and the federal legal system does not recognise human rights at all. 
Uh, in Victoria, in the ACT, and more recently in Queensland, we have charters of human rights or human rights and responsibilities. There is no equivalent at the federal level. So if the Parliament of the Federation passed an act which required all people of a particular species to be executed, um, then subject to constitutional arguments which don't readily occur to me, that would probably be a valid law. The fact, the fact is that we have for a very long time had laws in the federal parliament which say that if people come to Australia seeking asylum, they will be put in detention and stay in detention until they get a visa or until they are removed from the country. Now, recently, that was tested in a very difficult case in the High Court. Um, it was a guy who was who came to Australia without a visa. Um, he was assessed as a refugee. He was given refugee a refugee visa, and um, uh, after about ten or twenty years, he committed some offences, which invoked Section five hundred and one of the Migration Act and the minister cancelled his visa or revoked his visa on character grounds because he had been imprisoned for uh, 12 months. Now, the question was whether he could remain in detention. He was, he was put in detention because he's a non-citizen without a visa. And he was put in detention, but the federal court said, no, no, they're not looking to give him a visa and they're not looking for another country to send him to because they can't send him away because he's a refugee. Um, so he can't be held in detention. That's what the federal court said. The government of Australia went straight to the high court. The high court ruled four to three that that man can remain in detention and in principle he can remain in detention for the rest of his life. Now, if that isn't a, a, an abuse of human rights, I don't know what is. Mm. It's a, it's a travesty, it, um, quite yeah. simply, isn't it? And um, Sorry, Stuart, did you want to comment to that point? Yeah, well, it, it, Julian's just given us a statement of enormous cruelty, sanctioned, bolstered and approved of by a, an abusive federal government that seems to have no idea of the principles of a common humanity. The first point that Julian made about um, the right to a life and the... I mean, the third, there's, there's one word that peppers all 30 clauses of the Universal Declaration. It's about the dignity of every, of, every human, of every human being. For me, human rights are about the set of standards by which we, by which we live. Although they happen in, uh, to be enshrined in the 30 clauses of the Universal Declaration, but there's plenty of evidence that um, they, that commitment to a sense of fairness and decent treatment of everyone existed for centuries and it's, it looks to me as though it's it's um, embedded in the in the traditions of the great religions so uh, and for me the human rights is about not just about the law but it's about a, a discourse between us the kind of dialogue we're having every, every with your friends and uh, colleagues every day of the week because that that um, puts the um, puts flesh on the bones of of the human rights principles, and it's constantly, it's constantly going, going on. I mean, for example, everybody having a right to work, and there being a right to equal pay, but but women know that that's not correct. So there has to be a constant discourse, uh, if you like, uh, almost a, almost a tug of war. Um, to, to try to live up to that standard. There's an ongoing discourse and discussion about all of that, about rights, um, and, and about, about the obligations that go with rights. For example, it's frequent, human rights are frequently criticised as not having um, responsibilities and obligations, but if you look at the, all the clauses, it's quite clear that there are um, obligations and responsibilities written into every right. Thank you. And that's a beautiful segue into, I guess, the second part of the question, Julian, that I wanted to ask of you. And it actually comes from uh, a viewer, a, a viewer, a supporter from Wheeler Centre, his, who was Sean. And, and he wrote, how do we best fight for justice, firstly, for our Aboriginal people here? 
and also for the persecuted peoples in our closest neighbours of West Papua? Good question. Um, Recognising them as human beings comes at the very first. And may I say, I was thinking as you acknowledged the traditional owners of this country, that maybe the, I mean, you can't go anywhere in Melbourne without hearing an, an acknowledgement of the traditional owners, but maybe we should also acknowledge that our ancestors took the land from them and caused them immense damage. And then we increased the damage by taking their children from them. And until 1992 or five, the theory which underlay our dispossession of the Aboriginal people of their land was that they did not own the land. And it's true that they don't have a conception of ownership of the land. Their relationship to the land is rather like oh. that of child and parent. Now, the, even these days, most kids don't think that they own their parents, even though they may act as if they do. Um, and, and yet the harm that you do when you snatch a parent away from the child is obvious to anyone. Um, so I think we we need to understand yeah, how much damage we did to them by taking their land from them. So treat them um, as human beings, acknowledge their humanity. Uh, that's right. And and we we really have done a very bad job at that in Australia. Okay. Can I respond to the, to the question about West Papua? Yes, of course. As mean, yes, because, please. Because... Um, we spent about 15 years at the, at the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies with a project uh, concerning West Papua. So we went to West Papua with, with a camera stuck down our shirt to, fil to film the genocide committed by the Kapasas uh, forces of Indonesia, trained by the Australians. So, um, and, and, and we gave refuge um, to uh, West Papuans in, in Australia, in Sydney, I can see the very buildings and rooms that, the, that they slept in. Uh, and I want to introduce the question about courage. Uh, it doesn't often occur in Canberra uh, sufficiently. Courage to, to stick by uh, another indigenous people, in this case, the people of West Papua. Because what's going on just up the road is is not just a cultural genocide, but a very, a very violent genocide, which we're supposed to be blind to. And um, you have to have the courage to say, uh, to draw a line in the sand and say to politicians and the media over this sort of issue, um, we won't put up with this uh, abuse anymore. But unfortunately, and this brings in, raises a question about economics, um, the University of Sydney closed the the centre down, closed down the West Papua project, um, ostensibly because we did not make enough money. <laughs> um, so uh, mm -hmm. the question about whether we do things for moral and ethical reasons or whether they are done for cost-effective reasons is something that will come up again and again. That's, that's very, can, very Can true. I add one thing there? Can I add something Please? to that? Sure. Um, in his first answer, Stuart referred to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a really important document. And it was the project of <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of the previous president of the United States, at the end of the Second World War. And she decided that we needed a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, it, it was not ready until the end of 1948. Um, it is worth noting that the Australia, even though Australia had a very small population of, I think, about 7 million or so at the end of the Second World War, we contributed significantly to the Universal Declaration and it was an Australian, Doc Everett, who presided over the General Assembly of the UN on the 10th of December 1948 when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was embraced by the world community. And Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that all human beings have the right to seek asylum, and yet we treat them as criminals. And it was interesting that at the end of the Tampa case, which was handed down in Melbourne at quarter past two in the afternoon on the 11th of September 2001, just a few hours before the attack on America, as soon as the attack on America happened, 
John Howard started calling boat people illegals because, of oh. course, all boat, all boat people were supposedly Muslim, not true, and all terrorists were Muslim, also not true. Uh, all, the, all the terrorists who attacked America were Muslim, but what followed from that in his assertion, I think, was that all Muslims are terrorists, and that's obvious nonsense. So he began calling boat people illegal. So in Australia, you've got a population who think that criminals are being locked up for our protection. So it was Scott Morrison when he was immigration minister under Tony Abbott, started referring to border protection and our grotesque abuse of human rights, inconsistent with, apart from anything else, Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, it, it is that grotesque abuse of human rights which is justified because the Australian public have got much more important things to think of, think that we are being, we're locking up criminals for our own protection. And if only, if only we realised how false that is. Weaponising or weaponising minorities as if there was some sort of threat to the stability of a country. And it, it, I think for me it brings into, into bear this, this new question, this question that conservatives will throw at both of you, the likes of you, and say, look, um, if we're going to focus on all these human rights, you know, um, business, let's just focus on the local. Let's not worry about those global issues because that's got nothing to do with how we get through the run of the day and our, our, our day-to-day issues. You're, you're distracting us from our own backyard and that's really where our focuses need to be. Um, when, when you have that argument thrown at you, Stuart, I mean, what's your response to keep it local, forget the global, because it's beyond, our, it's beyond the sphere of our you know, capacity to deal with? Look, in an age of COVID pandemics and, um, and uh, massive assaults on, on, um, on the planet, you've seen, it, you've only, you know, mo- large chunks of America and Siberia are on fire at the moment. I don't see, I mean, local is important, but almost, almost irrelevant. I've just been looking at the work and times and talking to people in South Africa about a great internationalist. His name was Nelson Mandela who said, for example, that um, South Africans uh, will not be entirely free until the people of Palestine are free. And it's precisely that vision and that courage and that commitment that we need to hear more. And with reference to uh, Julian's apt reminder about, um, about Clause 14 and the right to seek asylum, the trouble is in Australia that... Um, uh, Australians are not, when they protest about uh, the, the alleged human rights abuses in other countries, they're never taken seriously because we're not consistent about supporting and being enthusiastic and consistent about the defence of human rights here. We, we regard it as, um, as Julian said earlier, as a kind of inconvenience to people in power. And um, it's it's a kind of political equivalent of domestic violence. So the, you, you only have to watch certain ministers, I won't name them, but one's called Dutton. You only have to see the, the, um, the, their posture and their language um, to know that uh, human rights are not taken very seriously here, and at least not consistently. And can I just ask you, um, Julian, on that point? I mean, th- this is a question from Naomi, who was, which was sent in, it, and it's relating to this issue. So the pandemic has heightened the debate over individual freedom versus collective responsibility. Right? So instead of looking at human rights as mine versus yours, how do we change the narrative so it's human rights is about us? Um. If, if I understand the question correctly, I would say that there comes a time when individual rights have to be sacrificed in order to make rational steps against a common enemy. I mean, during the Blitz in, in London in the early 1940s, um, apparently there was a law which made it a criminal offence to be inside at night with the lights on and have the curtains open. Now, the idea that you couldn't have your curtains open and having them open was a criminal offence is very striking these days, but it to require people to close their curtains was a rational step 
in defending the country. And I think that each of us has to be prepared to sacrifice some of our rights in order to defend the country. But that does not justify, it does not justify the general Australian tendency to ignore um, the brutality shown towards the Rohingya people in Myanmar or the brutality presently being shown to the Hazara people in Afghanistan by the Taliban, and nor does it, nor does it justify um, many grotesque human rights. It certainly doesn't justify locking up innocent human beings who've come to Australia seeking asylum as they're entitled to do. But the problem... So that collective the problem, sense of responsibility and that collective sense of obligation then, and accountability to those other, you know, persecuted minorities, some would argue and say rightfully, you know, in their opinion, that that's not our concern. That's not our concern is what happens within the Australian borders. And so if something is happening in Myanmar, it's very unfortunate. But, you know, Australia should not be getting itself involved with that. I mean, how, well, do, how do you respond to that, Stuart? Yeah. That's, well, that's an incredibly selfish notion. I mean, the re reconstruction uh, of Europe after the Second World War was dominated by a, a, a set of policies that you could describe as about, they were about the dominance of altruism over egoism. It was about collective well-being. It was about a common humanity. Um, even, even the availability of universal health insurance, which came to be known in some circles as the gift relationship. You give, you give to the stranger without expectation of reward. Now, that set of values, that sort of language, those sorts of ethics are, are, are what is needed to be, to be desperately and to be urgently resurrected. I mean, the notion of, of human rights is about a common humanity. And in a sense, the, the individual and the collective, uh, the, the collective merge. It's not about private and individual accumulation. Um, it's about the, the freedom, freedom from oppression and the freedom to enjoy a, a diverse opportunities. That's a common humanity. That's the common good. And we, we desperately need that language to be heard and not the appalling, narrow, some ways boring parochialism that you hear from, from politicians. I mean, if I can, uh, uh, Julian's mentioned uh, the Rohingya, the, the, um, and the, the treatment of indigenous people, the treatment of, of, the, um, of what's going on in Yemen and the, um, and the Tamils of Sri Lanka. But let me refer quickly to the, to the Palestinian people subject to the longest and most brutal occupation since the Second World War. And Australia has been one of the worst cowards in, in this respect, because every time there was a resolution at the, um, at the United Nations, we, are, we, we either abstained or we sided with, with um, the United States and Israel. I mean, there was, there was a famous resolution, I think in December 2016, Resolution 2334, in which the vote in the Security Council declaring declaring uh, settlements illegal was 10 to 0. But the Foreign Minister of Australia announced that if Australia had had a vote, and it didn't, we would have voted against. And we're all, we, 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 we completely overlook the collective interests of, 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 of everyone, but in particularly of the, the vulnerable. And can you just explain for the sake I, of brevity here? I'm yeah. trying to think... Sorry. I'm inclined to think that one explanation for that is also an explanation for the general denial of human rights elsewhere in this country, and that is the attention you get from the press. I mean, you and I, Stuart, will be branded anti-Semites after this evening, largely because of what you've just said and partly because we both think that the Palestinians are getting a pretty rough deal. Um, well, that, um, can, I, can, I just, I, I, can I just interrupt you there? Because I think that's a valid, you're making a really valid point there, Julian. And I want to bring in one of the questions on you know, the increasing or the rise of authoritarianism. And where does authoritarianism fit into this debate and this question over, over monitoring and muting free speech and the ability to call out human rights abuses for what they are without it being seen as sidestepping or, or diminishing the recognition of the peoples. Can you, can you explain to me 
why that delineation is so important and what it looks like. Yeah. I, I think it's important because of the, the fact that you cannot speak to each individual member of the community. We depend on news getting around through the press. And the fact is that we, are, we have a very bad deal with the press in Australia. Now, uh, the Israelis, to their credit, are very, very good at contacting people who they think are giving the wrong message. And so, you know, if you call people like Stuart and me, anti semites that, that, that gets free, free play in the press. And if it doesn't get free play in the Murdoch press, then it will get put around else otherwise. Um, I think that makes a big difference. The fact is you cannot get people interested in human rights abuses unless they know about them. And, and for that, for them to know about them, they either have to read a book like Stuart's or they have to read their, see it in their daily newspaper, you know, the Herald Sun or whatever. And that is highly unlikely. They just don't get that sort of news in the press these days. And I think that's one of the major, major human rights problems in Australia. Yeah. Stuart, what did you want to say on that issue? Well, two quick responses. One is the point that uh, Julian's making about, you know, what narrative do people hear? What story do people hear? And, um, and only and historically, it was into almost entirely the Israeli story. You barely heard about the Palestinians. They were, they were defined as people who blew up airplanes in the desert. And they were they were they were uh, terrorists. Even the Nakba, the the um, the tragedy for the for the Palestinian people, the the, um, the sudden driving of seven hundred thousand people from their homes, the erasure, the 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 disappearance of almost all of urban Palestine overnight in 1948. That 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 narrative is only slowly being heard, and even the the. Um, you know the slaughter of 250 people uh, and the and the um, the injuring of uh, over 20,000 in the march of return that started in March 2018 isn't heard about. So that the first point that I'm making, perhaps taking a long time to make it, is about a different narrative. And and Julian is absolutely correct to say that you get a perverse and uh, uh, version from the mainstream media. I mean the second point I'll make is, is really the theoretical one about the use of power. The abuse of, it's very, it's a very lazy way to only use power in a top-down manner. That's gone on for centuries, mostly at the expense of women and kids. Um, and it's, it's not very bright, it's not very clever, but it's easy. You just, it's, it's a bit, it's as though, you, it's as though the whole of the world can be run like a prison. And, on the, and people on the receiving end feel like that. So the abusive, we have to use, we have to think of much more creative ways to use power that enhance everyone's lives. And we're probably going to come to that if we talk a little bit about the relationship between the arts and human rights um, a and bit we, later. We will get to that. We will get to that. But, but in terms of addressing abuses of power and dismantling those systems, I have another question here, which is, should we reduce business ties with countries that have systematic human rights abuses? Should we be aiming really to cut off the economic ties or merely make a gesture? And I'm, I'm not sure if you're both aware of the Ben and Jerry's ice cream uh, announcement that oh, yes. was made yes. just in, in recent days and the furor that has caused expectedly on one side of the argument and the celebration on the other. Um, what's your stance on how effective well, these ties are in, or breaking these ties are in achieving, I mean, do the ends justify the means? Well, no, it's, it's, it's crucial. You can't, you can't make a commitment to universal human rights and then say, well, we'll trade, we'll trade with, with abusive people and abusive powers. I mean, Martin Luther King um, taught me that, um, that sanctions on abusive people were not, were, were a moral obligation. It didn't have to, it didn't, didn't require much justification. So, so we, can't, we can't maintain a kind of um, worldwide hypocrisy by saying that um, trade and uh, trade must always dominate over the interests of human rights. We don't, 
We don't have, in terms of COVID, in terms of authoritarianism, in terms of a burning planet, we don't have a lot of time. We have to say that, that <laughs> the salvation for everybody, the better way of thinking and living has to be about human rights. It's not about, it's not about uh, Tom and Jerry's ice cream. Okay, well, Julian, in terms of economic policies, is there an alternative to states' reliance on a free market or the neoliberal economic policies and the consequences in relation to poverty and homelessness and hunger when we have this conversation? I think that um, a position of political and economic power can be used for the benefit of people. Um, I mean, I, I think I would differ from Stuart in his last answer. I think I would say that it is possible in theory for countries to use their trade relationship with an, uh, a country that is abusing human rights. It is possible for them to have behind-the-scenes conversations about those things and warn them that if they don't improve their game, they will find themselves without the necessary trade. Now, whether that works, I don't know. That's a question of real politic, which I don't claim to be an expert in. But that I just don't think that you can automatically say that maintaining trade relations with a country that is abusing human rights is inevitably bad. Because if it were, we would lose all our trade relationships very quickly. Um, and I hope... Or we might, or we might finish up with a very different set of international relations. I mean, if you take, for example, the export of live sheep to the Middle East, eventually, for, as a result of um, protests from the bottom up, um, that that cruel trade um, was um, at least as the worst effects of it were addressed. The same with the slaughter of them. Um, of, uh, of Australian cattle in Indonesian and Vietnamese abattoirs. So, uh, and, uh, but I want to come back to the question about um, the free market. Let's be very clear that a great deal of the cruelties that people have experienced over the past 30, 40 years are, be are, are the result of those economic policies. You don't just have to read them. Um, Nobel Prize winners like Joseph Stiglitz to know the massive cruelty across America that that penalizes people who allegedly can't compete in 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 in, in the mar in the commercial marketplace that um, that even sees making money out of people's sickness um, see, seeing seeing health systems as a means of commercial gain is is it derives from let's call it what it is it's about capitalism. It's about it's about the accumulation of wealth by 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 certain powerful people. It's about the massive growth of inequalities, and where you have massive inequalities, you have you have a guarantee of violence, and you have a guarantee of abuse of human rights. So we have to struggle towards a, a, a very different economic system. Uh, uh, it's going to be a system about fellowship, and in a way. Some of the things that have happened during COVID have reminded people of the, of the example that Julian gave about what the British did during the Blitz, even the business of social distancing and wearing a mask and trying to respect one another. We can, that needs to be, there's almost an expression of, dare I use the word, love, for, for even for the stranger in, in that behavior. And why wouldn't love be an engine for future economic and social policies. Oh, it's very radical of you to suggest something like that, Stuart, honestly. <laughs> um, and I, and, and and ha I, Stuart, having said that, I would not want to be understood as supporting an anti-capitalist view because I think I am a capitalist and I would not argue against capitalism, but it needs to be restrained. I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, we, we, well, we really I, have... We, just, we have a responsibility, I'll take six, 45 seconds. I mean, we have a responsibility to identify all the casualties of capitalism, the massive suicide rates, the millions of people regarded as worthless, the mil 65 million people who are not entirely about capitalism, who are refugees, the massive extent of homelessness, um, the, 
the um, the pessimism, the surveys across Europe recently that, that identify the pessimism of young people about the future. Well, I'm sorry, we have to we have to think and we have to cease being even moderate about these issues. We have we, the the title of this talk has the word crisis in it, and we are facing a crisis. Yeah, we are. And I'm going to segue to another crisis from from a viewer, from Gideon. And Gideon has asked, he's put a bit of context into it, and now this is to both of you. But Articles 55 and 56 of the Fourth Geneva Convention unequivocally demand that an occupier must supply the conquered subjects with life-sustaining food and medical requisites, and to quote, to the fullest extent of the means available to it. Australian soldiers are rightly being investigated for one of for one-on-one -on -one war crimes in Afghanistan, but why not the politicians who sent them there? And aren't they complicit in the millions of avoidable Afghan deaths from war-imposed deprivation? So, just that little issue there. Julian. I agree with the proposition. I agree with the proposition. I do not think politicians should get away with what they're doing um, because they're, the, the wrongdoing that is alleged to have been engaged in by Australian soldiers was done presumably at the request of or the orders of, ultimately, Australian politicians. I don't, if, mm -hmm. if a politician mm -hmm. can, be, can be properly shown to be responsible for conduct, I don't think the position of politicians so should be. Do you be think the culpability, the culpability is equal for the actions um, committed by the soldier and those who? basically directed their, you know, incursions? I think that depends on particular circumstances. Um, what about the culpability of someone like Adolf Eichmann who, who directed the, the Holocaust? Uh, I would have thought mm. his culpability was greater than the culpability of individual officers who simply did what they were ordered to do and were required by law to do. Um, so, if but if if an individual politician directs uh, an Australian soldier to behave in a way which involves a war crime, then maybe their culpability would depend on the circumstances. It might be as great as that of the soldier who does it, or it might be less. Um, if if the soldier does it a number of times, then I would have thought their culpability was broadly equivalent. Yeah, I mean, it raises the, the, it raises the general principle about accountability, the accountability of all of us for, our, for the consequences of our actions, but particularly the accountability of, of the state, which is becoming more and more invisible, the, the people who make decisions that uh, lead to human rights abuses and chronic fatalities and wars, uh, but they're, they're not held accountable. In a way, George Bush and John Howard and Tony Blair should all be in the dock over the invasion yet, of yet, Iraq. And yet you, you say that, Stuart, and, and, and straight away I think of The Hague and I think of the dictators from African nations who have been tried and who have been held to account, and even in Bosnia, for example. So why do we sort of, why is there a divide and why is there a line over who we hold to account and who we do, who we do and who we don't? Tasneem, you have raised an absolutely crucial issue. It looks as though, from, from Africans' point of view, it looks as though the ones who are easiest to um, put in the dock in The Hague are the ones who are, who are charged. And um, I'd have to say there's some kind of, I don't know... Col col I would have said colour-coded justice, but you can call it something yeah, well, else. You know, well, you've answered the question better than I could. You just said it. And um, okay. you, can't, you can't talk about accountability and, and not hold um, the people who send soldiers to war, who declare illegal wars, uh, you, you can't say that they're responsible for nothing. Um, and I think people would, would you know, the, the, we keep on being told that politicians are not, not held in um, great regard. I think if there was accountability, and that's partly why there's an attempt to have a federal ICAC in this country, um, there would be greater trust in, in, in government. And uh, that word trust is something we might want to um, toy with too. It's difficult, that. To avoid, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion 
that the idea of the winner always being right is at or the loudest, the loudest, the loudest I, I, wouldn't, yes. I wouldn't say it's the uh, you know color coded thing um i think you know the the entity that wins is usually the entity which has done nothing wrong the entity which is not punished and that's why it's very healthy if australian soldiers are to be brought to account for misbehaving and why the politicians that caused it if there are any should be equally held to account um well, but if you if that. you if you Sorry, Julia, I, I just want to, I, we've only got a few minutes left and there's a couple of things I want to get through. The first of them is I want to bring to uh, attention, Stuart, your book. And Julian highlighted the role of poetry, your deployment of poetry in your book. So Cruelty and Humanity, it, it presents this beautiful poetic balance almost to the detailed horrors and justices of man's inhumanity to man. You've almost balanced it out. I just want to ask you very quickly, Stuart, what prompted this deliberate pairing of prose with, I guess, a very gritty narrative writing? Well, because, I mean, in a way, if I'd stuck only with the cruelties, it would have been so macabre as to be um, forbidding. And added to that, when you talk to people about, you know, what, what gives great pleasure in their lives, what gives them inspiration and insight, they talk about art, they talk about music, they talk about flower arrangement, they talk about dance, they talk about poetry and their kids and photographs and so on. And it was that creative inspirational dimension that I needed to, to um, bring in. I mean, I was always influenced by William Wordsworth. I mean, we were taught at school that he only wrote about, um, uh, about daffodils and skylarks. In fact, he wrote a great deal about the common humanity. What a fair world were ours for verse to paint if power could live at ease with self-restraint, he said. Now you can hear in those, just those lines that there's a different, that there's a language for humanity. We, we've, we've, talk, we've been talking about war um, because a great deal of the policies of powerful governments are about militarism. You know, Australia wants to have more, more submarines and more tanks and sell more weapons. Why don't we talk about peace, or rather peace with justice? Why don't we, if that was the language, if those were the values, and you can see that in great poetry, the, the expression of concern for, the, for animals, for people, and for planet Earth. And that was why I have peppered that book with wonderful poetry. It's very clear. And when you think of the power of poetry and being subversive and being proactive, I think of people like Behrouz Bochani, the Kurdish um, asylum seeker and refugee, whose words were so powerful in, in documenting his life experience and to the extent that he was, in fact, persecuted for his works. And that Julian, art is, a, is I know it's a big, it's a big uh, um, area of interest in your life, both professionally and personally. Can I ask, you know, what is it about art that you think is so instrumental in leveraging public opinion and shifting public opinion on human, human rights issues? It's very difficult to articulate. I think, I think it is because art somehow gets ideas into us before we have an opportunity to block them out. Now, I have often said, and I do believe, that, you know, most people, if not everyone, has heard of Leonardo da Vinci. Most people, if not everyone, has heard of Ludwig van Beethoven or Leo Tolstoy. I wonder if anyone can name a lawyer, an accountant, an economist, or a general who worked at the same place at the same time as any of them. Will, we, will anyone be remembered who contributes to the human race in ways other than by creating the sort of uh, direct and compelling uh, communication that art involves? I, I, I doubt it. Oh, that's, that's a very powerful vision. And, and I like that. To be, to be candid, as we face, as we face the end of mankind, as we know mankind, with the COVID and climate change especially, as we face our end, um, we really have to ask ourselves, will any of us be remembered? I mean, I, I was fascinated reading Stuart's book. A lot of the names of the, uh, even the American generals from the time of 9-11, I had to scratch my head and remember who the hell they were. And yet most people could not say that of the great artists who all of us have heard of. 
Yes, you know, these a, people lot don't, the, they don't a lot need, of the emerging artists as well that, that definitely need a lot more promotion on that issue. So I, I, I won't disagree with you. Look, we ha in the last minute, I'll give you a minute each here. I wanted to ask you, that, and I want us to end with some sort of practical solutions that are more positive um, towards the end of what can we do to enable change, right? So the challenge of living with a persistent virus, we don't know how long COVID is going to stay here. We have wars. We have the oppression of minorities. We have rampant violence against women across the globe. We have devastating climate change. We have all of these things. But in the spirit of a solutions-focused approach, I want to ask you what you envisage can be done to preserve human rights, just from an individual level at least, so that we can get up each day with hope. Um, I'll ask you first, Stuart. Well, it, for me, it's embodied in the question I posed in the title of the book, cruelty or humanity, that, that, that's the choice. And if you go, and of course I want everyone, all of us, uh, you know, to, to go towards the humanitarian alternatives, which involves for me a, um, a sort of constant conversation at the crossroads to refer to the program that, um, that we took part in um, a few months ago. That means that the kind of conversation we've had, the three of us have had this evening, needs to be multiplied in every possible con context with every possible group. And for me, it's about a language for humanity. You have to redefine what you mean by humanity. You have to redefine what you mean by, by human rights and certainly redefine what you mean by politics. Uh, if politics continues to be only about top-down use of power disproportionately by men, in, a, in and out of uniform, then we face uh, the eradication of planet Earth. Uh, but if, 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 if politics is about creative, imaginative, life-enhancing use of power... Julian, in 60 seconds or less, can you command us to what you think would be some positive things that we can do at, at, at this particular dour time? Okay, I think the very first thing is we need to know what is going on. I hold a very optimistic view about Australian character. I think if Australians understood the plight of the Rohingya, for example, if they knew that Rohingyan babies were thrown onto fires in order to burn them alive, if they, if they could understand these things, I think they would rise up and protest. And that is exactly what we need in this country. We need people to understand what is going on and to object to it because most decent human beings will object to that sort of conduct. We need to face the facts. That's the thing. We need to face the facts. We also need to understand the sort of stuff that Stuart is talking about. We need to understand that um, you know, women and children get a really raw deal in our community not as bad now as it was 100 years ago, but not good. Um, maybe we should try to imagine what it is like to be in the position of those people whose rights are being abused and ask yourself, would you like to be in that position? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's it's a very confronting but a very necessary sort of reality check is of putting yourself in the shoes of that person and having developing empathy where there's none i think that's that's a that's a challenge to to all our listeners and viewers i, I suspect many of us do that um but not enough and not those that need to i think that's a really important call look thank you both thank you both for your time i know we've we've covered quite a gamut of of issues within within 60 minutes or just just a little bit over um i think your insights have been incredible there was even divergence of opinion at some stage and i think to what stuart was talking about is like having the conversation to the first place i think that's so essential in, in being able to table different opinions and that's dialogue is how we also then you know conquer difference and how we conquer um how, how we conquer hate and division so i think it's a necessary starting point to all of that uh, your time has been has been really appreciated and on behalf of Wheeler Centre for Free Palestine I want to thank you both for your contributions this evening and just to alert our, our listeners and our viewers to the fact that both Stuart's book Cruelty and Humanity and Julian's book Watch Out, Watching Out Reflections on Justice and Injustice are both available from the Hill of Content bookshop. Um, you can buy them 
online. Obviously, we can't go in to buy them, but uh, their, their website is um, www.hillofcontentoneword.com. So uh, seek the books out if you want to get, in, you know, get your headspace into more of this, these conversations. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who enables tonight's session to, to flow so seamlessly. Um, again, the supporters um, and the sponsors. And I'm going to end on a very, very brief quote by Indigenous activist Leela Watts who in the 1985 UN Conference on Women, she famously quipped, she said, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. And I think that it sort of imbues the ethic of tonight. So thank you and good night. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and around the world.